Chapter Twenty Three of The Golden Bow by George Gibbs. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tony Oliva. The Priest. Tanya was again called at daylight, and after an excellent breakfast, they were on their way, Tanya afoot, until they neared the high road, when she coolly bade good-bye to Herr Hochwald and without further words entered her prison to be driven all morning steadily toward weingarten he has gone on reported herr markoff after a while that is well but we must not trust him she replied until we are safe upon the other border of the lake will you forgive me fraulein asked markoff she raised the lid of her queer carriage and thrust out her hand toward him with all my heart my friend and then do you think he has any idea of what we carry i don't know but he shall not take it you are armed yes he must keep away from us late to-night we will be at the Zweisler waldhaus near weingarten there i am well known among old friends you shall see do you think there will be a message from munich she questioned anxiously i hope so that we received none at memmingen was an indication only that all is well with herr roland i pray that it may be true she said earnestly a wagon was coming along the road in front of them and so tanya lowered the lid quickly and was silent herr hochwald did not approach them all that day markoff reported his figure in the distance two or three times but it was not until dusk when the lights of weingarten leaped into view before them that they came upon him suddenly at a turn in the road waiting for them a long day he muttered i am weary where do you go to-night markoff halted fra umberto and throwing the reins over the donkey's back strode forward determinedly we will come to an agreement here and now herr hochwald he said with grim politeness our ways are parted yonder the night is fine your robe heavy you will sleep quite comfortably under the stars as for us whither we go is no concern of yours is it understood hochwald looked up at the tall figure for a moment then shrugged as you please drive on herr musician markoff examined the man a moment in silence and then obeyed but as they approached weingarten herr markoff reported the dark figure a threatening shade in the gloom following at a distance behind them but they reached the vault house without further incident it was an inn built in a much earlier day at some distance from the high road and situated at the edge of a thick forest of well-grown pine trees the proprietor was a compatriot of herr markoff's a small man with an expansive smile and a huge paunch upon which the privations of the war had made little impression when fra umberto had been put into a stable and the packages of notes brought into the house and safely hidden in a room upstairs tanya and markoff breathed more freely for though nothing had been seen of the black cassock of herr hochwald for an hour or more tanya knew that he could not be far away when all their arrangements for the night had been completed markoff dispatched herr zweisler to the telegraph office for messages for herr liedenthal the name that he and roland had agreed upon when they had arranged their code it was midnight before herr zweisler returned but he brought the message which markoff and tanya eagerly deciphered by the light of the kitchen lamp in english it would have read somewhat as follows three beds at twenty marks seven chairs at three marks two washstands one bureau forty-one marks all used but in good condition bought to-day munich and will be shipped by weingarten to lindenhof when railway facilities permit decoded this meant pursuit leave donkey weingarten am coming lindenhof the hay-cart creaked up hill and down dale all the long night from time to time tanya lying comfortably in concealment slept uneasily and in her waking moments peered out over the tail-board along the grey stretch of road where she had last seen the figure of the monk 
a dark blot on the velvety night once he had come quite near until he walked only a few paces behind the cart but markoff had warned him away and at last he had sullenly obeyed for an hour or more now they had lost sight of him but with the coming of dawn they saw in the distance a market cart like their own and upon its seat with the driver the figure in black herr hochwald was tireless and persistent the message from roland had been alarming pursuit that meant immediate discovery unless they deserted fra umberto and the hurdy-gurdy it meant discovery perhaps even there at the Waldhaus of the hospitable herr zweisler if any agents of the police had noticed them travelling that day toward weingarten the rest of the message was explicit leave donkey weingarten am coming lindenhof there was nothing to do weary as they were but obey and so negotiating at once with a neighbor of the innkeeper they had managed for a proper consideration to hire the hay-cart in which they were now approaching their destination beneath the hay in an old bag that herr zweisler had provided were the banknotes of nemi no one had bothered them at least no one but the threatening figure of the false monk and markoff seemed fairly confident of dealing with that gentleman when the time came the owner of their cart was a country lout too stupid to ask questions content with a small bundle of five-mark notes which were the excellent compensation for the use of his cart which was to be returned in a few days but as the grey dawn spread over the heavens and from the high hill over which their long road wound tanya could see in the distance far below her the pale mist rising from the lake she had for the first time a feeling that success was within her reach to hire a boat to sail across to the swiss shore seemed simplicity itself for at arbonne or romanshorn she would throw herself and her possessions upon the protection of the swiss authorities until a wire to shestov or Bartou would bring them to identify her and reclaim the property of the society of nemi but success without the safety of philippe roland was not to be thought of and coming lindenhof he had wired but how when the fact of his coming through from munich by train covering in a few short hours the distance that she and herr markoff had taken four weary days to travel seemed almost unbelievable and yet herr markoff was hopeful he had great confidence in the ingenuity of herr roland and the message had been explicit am coming lindenhof and since the code messages had been filed at the hauptbahnhof before eleven o'clock last night herr roland had planned in some way to take the night train from munich which would reach lindau in the early morning the reasoning was sound too obvious indeed to tanya who knew that the excellent herr markoff could do no less than encourage her in the belief that all would go well she knew that already philippe had succeeded in accomplishing the impossible by the very spontaneity of his daring but to travel openly upon a train from munich bound for the swiss border could be nothing less in tanya's eyes than the wildest desperation which only courted the death he had so far miraculously escaped she feared for him now more than ever and regretted painfully as she had already done many times upon her journey that she had consented to leave him in danger in munich while she had gone on in comparative safety with herr markoff and yet success seemed so near the swiss shore came out of the mists like a pleasant mirage of a sought-for oasis to the thirsty in the desert an hour more to lindenhof an hour upon the water and safety but not without philippe as to that she was resolved the very imminence of their meeting the chances of failure the danger of arrest for them all the joyous meaning of success all these possibilities conflicting in the turmoil of her thoughts had tried her endurance to its limit and her nerves were stretched to the breaking point but the patient face of herr markoff was her inspiration 
he merely smiled at her calmly and bade her have courage for he knew that she would still have need of it as they approached lindau the market cart in which herr hochwald rode drew nearer and tanya saw him descend and hurry forward to overtake them herr markoff stopped the hay cart and got down upon the ground i've warned you herr hochwald he said coolly that i will have no interference with the affairs of the fraulein we offer no impediment to your escape go your ways but leave us in peace hochwald smiled at tanya who was sitting upright listening have i not avoided you we shall do better alone do you go on herr hochwald or shall we with your permission we will wait a moment and discuss the matter just beyond the hill ahead of us is poldotz it is a town upon the railroad and there we will find officials telegraph officers and soldiers from the lindau caserna who keep guard and what of that my word against yours prison for us all perhaps but not if you act the part of wisdom what do you want merely to accompany you across the lake impossible it is very little that i ask of you think a moment suppose that i should reveal the real meaning of your journey the actual value of the truckload you hauled to market markoff and tanya exchanged helpless glances he knew had known all the while you see continued hochwald easily we have indeed come to the parting of the ways beyond boldolt's safety if i go with you refuse me now herr markoff and you will never pass the bahnhof and when i denounce you hochwald laughed i shall merely say that i am an agent of the government who has followed you here from munich they may arrest me but his excellency will forgive me much if i bring him this excellent proof of my fealty he paused with a shrug and turned to tanya if the fraulein will deign to advise herr markoff is somewhat undetermined with a sinking heart tanya assented crawling back miserably under the hay herr markoff climbed up to his seat and they drove on hochwald following boldly some paces in the rear at boldolz a soldier stood in the middle of the road and even while herr markoff was wondering what he should say to him herr hochwald strode forward toward the corporal who stood leaning against the railroad gate smoking a pipe fodder and farm produce for the abbey at einsweiler he said soberly i came up last night the soldier nodded and then inquired you've seen nothing of a man driving a donkey hitched to a piano organ no nothing pass father markoff drove on across the railroad tracks down the hill was there an abbey at einsweiler he didn't know but he couldn't help admiring the skill with which herr hochwald had guided them past a difficulty which might have proved embarrassing below the hill markoff gathered new courage for familiar landmarks were all about him and there on the border of the lake not half a mile away was their destination i hope that you know where you're going herr markoff said hochwald with a laugh the words of markoff's reply were inaudible to tanya but there was a world of meaning in his tone she lay in concealment while the cart rumbled across more railroad tracks over a rough road and finally came to a stop at a word from markoff she emerged from her place of concealment and sat up looking around her she was in a quadrangle or courtyard paved with cobbles the walls and buildings surrounding it in tumbled ruins but in front of her upon the margin of the lake was a tower once doubtless the keep of this ancient edifice which still stood defying the tooth of time and at the present moment showed definite signs of occupancy for upon a clothes-line beside the handsome gothic portal hung a variety of masculine undergarments like schloss kempelstein itself in various stages of disrepair 
there were fishing nets in the sunlight on the small jetty and piles of baskets and bottles under the protection of a wooden lean-to against a broken wall herr markoff had told tanya something of herr gratz the eccentric owner of this domain and so she was not unprepared for his greeting he emerged from the gothic doorway almost immediately an unprepossessing creature in soiled flannel trousers and undershirt he had a pointed nose small eyes deeply set under shaggy gray brows and as he strode forth from the door peering at his visitors he seemed far from hospitable and what do you want he began food ludwig said markoff herr gratz halted suddenly at the sound of markoff's voice and stared at him the ugly shadows in his face lifting magically you matthias the same but frau umberto and the instrument of torture more of that later for the present the fräulein here is weary a long journey a fräulein and a priest strange companions for matthias markoff who has so long forsworn both <laughs> he burst into laughter a dry cackle which indicated disuse herr markoff brought forth the bag from beneath the hay and followed their host into the tower the lower floor of which served as kitchen and living room if you will go upstairs fräulein said herr markoff i will bring you food and coffee markoff bag in hand with the air of a familiar to the premises already led the way hochwald watched him narrowly for a moment our agreement holds here herr markoff he flung after him as well as upon the road markoff chose to treat the remark with silence but the millions of nemi weighed upon him heavily though he was not a fighter by nature the situation perplexed rather than intimidated him he knew that hochwald was quite capable of carrying out his threat to reveal their secret to the authorities and the experience with the guard at boldolz had convinced him that the slightest sign of trouble here at lindenhof the firing of shots the sound of cries which could be heard upon the highway near by or upon the lake would mean speedy capture but he knew also that herr hochwald's other plan to reach switzerland safely with the fräulein and the money was the one he proposed to carry out unless markoff could prevent it hochwald's own safety hung on silence too so long as they remained in germany markoff tanya and hochwald shared a common secret and a common danger any one of them powerless without the silence and cooperation of the other two a strange partnership which markoff desired to terminate at the earliest opportunity but how to kill yes but he didn't believe in killing unless in self-defence this was not his own quarrel but his honour demanded the protection of fräulein korasoff he would protect her but the fräulein was going to make it difficult she would not embark until herr roland appeared suppose that he didn't come that something had happened it was of this that tanya spoke when they reached the upper floor it is eight o'clock herr markoff she said nervously herr roland is doubtless moving cautiously do not become alarmed that man he frightens me what do you propose to do are you fit to go on yes but not she paused and searched his face anxiously do you think that herr roland could have failed he shrugged how can i tell fräulein he replied softly End of chapter twenty three chapter twenty four of the golden bow by george gibbs this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by tony oliva a night adventure after clasping frau nisko warmly by the hand roland left number sixteen schweigerstrasse and went out into the darkness of a small street at the rear of the house the clock on the kitchen wall had told the hour of ten 
and he realized that he had a little more than an hour to accomplish his purpose of boarding the train for lindau it would be suicide to attempt without a passport the purchase of a ticket at the hauptbahnhof and it was with a feeling of great uncertainty as to the result of the project that he made his way across the bridge and in the general direction of the railway station he knew that any appearance of hesitation in his manner in the streets would lead to questions and arrest and so whistling cheerfully to keep up his courage he went his way along the Zomerstrasse as far as the schwanthaler museum the very one of which he professor leo knaus was curator when the hauptbahnhof looming in sight he turned to his left and followed a street which ran parallel to the railroad tracks having come this far he felt more encouraged for he was now in a region of breweries and factories where his rough clothes were less conspicuous than in the fashionable region through which he had just passed he realized that he wasn't very pretty to look at for there was a six days growth of beard upon his chin and the dust of the garret had completed the damage to georg zenf's clothing begun the other night upon the roofs poor zenf it was prison for him and for vice and bents the hour was not ripe for mutiny in germany but there had been signs next winter when the pinch of hunger came but this was no time to be thinking of misfortunes of the munich committeemen prison for a while and then conditional release with a warning his own case was more desperate and required a desperate expedient to board the eleven thirteen train without buying a ticket he went on until he reached the edge of the brewery district where he stopped in a small tobacconist's to buy pipe tobacco and ask questions the man behind the counter was old and querulous but roland found out what he wished to know that he had already passed the switches of the freight yards and that the straight double track to pazing began just here at friedenheim roland didn't wait to discuss the matter further for a clock upon the shelf indicated that the hour of eleven was near and so leaving the old man staring after him he went out abruptly and strode rapidly eastward across the tracks and at last coming to a stop in the shadow of an abutment close to the rails a train passed going toward the city and another approached him going eastward but it could scarcely be the time yet so he waited and watched it pass a train of goods cars calculating its speed and figuring on his chances of success if the speed of the eleven thirteen was no greater than this but what if he missed it or boarded a train for berlin by mistake he would have to take that chance silence except for the distant rattle of the train that had passed he glanced around him there was no one near no lights no watchmen no police he had chosen well there was a cinder path beside the track if for a few seconds he could get up as much speed as the train that was all he needed that and a good grip on something another train leaving munich he could see its lights and hear the rattle of its wheels as it crossed the switches he had tried to figure the passage of the minutes since he had left the tobacconists and was sure that the time of departure of the train he wanted had long since passed this must be it then he pulled his cap down firmly over his ears and peered out the exhaust of the locomotive warned him that this was an express slowly gathering speed but it was do or die now a light along the rails roland stepped back into the shadows an arm over his eyes to protect them from the glare then a deafening clank and roar as the engine passed ever gathering speed roland waited until one car passed two then darted out running furiously and sprang for the step as it passed a wrench at his armpit a moment of doubt as he clutched at the rail and then he lay along the footboard of the old-fashioned car for the moment quite safe 
there was no guard in sight but he could not tell how soon one would appear probably at pazing less than five minutes away and so clutching at the nearest guard rail he crouched and moved to the rear end of the coach there was one dark compartment but he did not dare raise his head above the sill to look in nor had he any intention of entering it indeed he had already made his plan and moving with great caution found an iron ladder between the cars and climbed quickly to the top of the coach along which he crawled upon hands and knees and finally lay flat with arms and legs extended bruised and breathless but quite happy he grinned to himself at the ease with which the thing had been accomplished and thought of the mess he would have made of himself if he had tried to take liberties of this kind with the empire state express or the manhattan limited at pazing he heard the call of the guard which reassured him that he had made no mistake this was the lindau train all right and the bodensee but eight or ten hours away if they did not see him if no one looked up he crawled over to the side away from the lights of the platform the travellers were all intent upon getting into their places and the guards in putting them there so that the sprawling figure in the gloom above them only a few feet away escaped notice but roland saw and heard there was a delay of a few moments while the officials waited for a tall man who had gotten down from a machine alongside the platform roland heard his rasping voice saw the guard salute and take his valise heard the obsequious excellency of the station agent and then the door of the compartment just below him crashed to and the train moved off into the darkness there was no mistaking von stromberg and his presence was reasonable enough even his departure from pazing instead of from the hauptbahnhof where he might have been recognized by those who could balk his plans roland wondered at his own stupidity in not realizing that the herr general would go to lindau rather than entrust so important an affair to a subordinate and if to lindau why not on the only train which left for that place to-night and here he was the old villain in the compartment roland might have entered not ten feet from where roland lay zoya rochal had said of roland that he was never so happy as when he was shooting at somebody and at this moment roland confessed to a strong desire to justify the statement he crawled along the top of the carriage until he reached the ventilator which let into the compartment von stromberg had entered but of course could see nothing there was an odor of a good cigar the rattle of a newspaper and then silence roland had seen no one but von stromberg enter the compartment and since there was no sound of other voices below him roland knew that the herr general was alone while roland was planning how best to take advantage of this extraordinary situation the train came to a stop again and he distinctly heard von stromberg's voice the caressing voice that roland remembered giving some orders to the guard in the second compartment of the last car he said suavely you will find a very beautiful lady you will recognize her by her hair which is as black as a raven's wing present my compliments and say that general von stromberg will be honored if she will share the journey with him Superfell, excellence muttered the man and departed toward the rear of the train running even now roland did not realize just what the message meant and until the guard returned accompanied by a slender woman in dark clothes with a small hat set rakishly upon her head roland didn't know that the beautiful lady with the dark hair was zoya rochal she stood for a moment in the glow of the open door it seemed looking up directly at the shadow where roland was as their glances met then he heard von stromberg's voice welcoming her ach madame this is indeed a pleasure 
and i had feared that i should be forced to pass this tedious journey with no one but myself for company unless an evil conscience i pray you to enter and make yourself quite at home the guard will bring your luggage so of course i had forgotten that you left munich so suddenly and then as she hesitated his voice more insistent come madame if you please roland heard her climb the steps heard the door shut behind her and then the shaken tones of her voice herr general how did you know madame do not pry behind my scenes it spoils the effect i know everything it's my trade the thing was so much more simple since there is but one train to lindau i was notified at pazing the moment you entered your compartment you do not object to the smell of tobacco so perhaps you will even condescend to smoke a cigarette with me the train was rumbling on into the darkness again and roland for the moment could hear no more indeed his ears were filled with one phrase and he could hear no other i know everything i know everything even the car wheels announced it the exhaust of the locomotive as the train went up grade if von stromberg was omniscient he was surely aware of roland perched on the car top just above his head listening at the ventilator something of the terror that zoya had expressed for the old man's devilish ingenuity came over roland at this moment he had seen something of von stromberg's power of will he wasn't frightened in the physical sense for fear of that kind clogs the brain the heart the muscles but the fact of zoya's presence and the old demon's knowledge of it had given roland a new sense of von stromberg's skill in divination which anticipated what it could not guess and guessed what it could not anticipate in all reason von stromberg could have no possible means of knowing that roland had jumped the train at friedenheim and was now crouched upon the top listening to this very interesting conversation back there in the schweigerstrasse roland had heard zoya rochal swear to the old man that he roland had escaped from munich but roland would have felt much more comfortable if zoya hadn't come what did her presence mean had she found out from frau nisko that roland had inquired as to the trains for lindau and determined to repair the dreadful damage she had done had decided to follow tanya and markoff to the bonzee and help them in the danger of von stromberg's pursuit or had she come seeking roland trying in helping him escape to atone for her treachery or had her mission some less pleasant purpose whatever her intentions whether good or bad the fact of her presence alone with von stromberg in the railway carriage below him was in itself a threat against roland's security for zoya knew that he planned to be on this train or she wouldn't have come and what might not the clever brain of the great counsellor succeed in wheedling from this woman of uncertain quality by persuasion bribery or threat during the long night journey that lay before them roland lay flat upon the car top his ear against the ventilator but could hear nothing except the low murmur of their voices once he heard von stromberg's laugh and then a little later zoya's they seem to be getting on famously for with the odor of the masculine cigar came that of a russian cigarette roland did not trust her beneath the smooth veneer that she had for years so carefully applied she had shown him to-night the rough grain beneath the tartar grain and he had scratched it perhaps she would give him away to the old man who would have the train searched at the next stop roland had half expected it but when nothing happened he breathed more freely at least so far she had held her tongue there was some good in the woman some loyalty left loyalty for roland at least that had rightfully belonged to herr markoff 
whom she had betrayed love whatever it was that she had for roland whatever it was had kept her lips sealed as the hours passed and nothing happened roland gained confidence in his luck barring new treachery in zoya rochal or some miraculous guesswork from his enemy below or the searching daylight he would come through safely to tanya and if he didn't get through safely to tanya he wouldn't be the only one who went down it was going to be a peach of a scrap while it lasted a peach and the old pelican would be one of those to keep him company in the last adventure but wasn't there something better than killing a lot of railroad guards old gentlemen with white whiskers for the most part with families of grandchildren at home to say nothing of getting killed oneself that wouldn't help america much or france or even the society of nemi what he had come into germany for was to save tanya from hochwald and bring the money back into switzerland he was on his way and unless some unforeseen disaster had occurred unless frau nisko had failed him the money and tanya were already nearing lindau with success so near he couldn't lose he mustn't and then the train stopped at kaufbeuren it had been in motion for more than two hours but the sound of voices was still to be heard in the carriage below roland tried to make out what they said my prisoner madame well to submit with a good grace mistrust your generosity broken faith manage this affair alone pay you well if i succeed but at lindau the military prison for a few days i will give especial instructions as to your comfort not prison excellency for a few days only i am sorry i can't forget your help in this affair a glass of wine never travel without it the ventilator permit me excellency i can reach quite easily from the seat her voice came suddenly very near roland's ear he heard her fingers on the mechanism and as he peered in through the hole in the roof a white object appeared within touch of his fingers a tiny scrap of paper he thrust his fingers in carefully and seized it a message from zoya before von stromberg's very eyes but he couldn't understand how he waited until the train moved on again and then brought the paper close to the ventilator to read the penciled scrawl patience he read before daylight that was all but it was eloquent enough he lay flat again puzzled but jubilant she had been looking for him as she came forward to von stromberg's compartment and had seen him crouching in the gloom above she had guessed what he would do that was clever of her the old pelican wasn't the only one who could guess roland suddenly had a sense of doing zoya a great injustice a great wrong he had been brutal with her back there in the room in the schweigerstrasse because he had thought that what she had done was beneath contempt forgetting her wound her weariness and the fear she had for this sardonic old brute who even now was talking of committing her to prison she could be no less weary now than she had been four hours ago and yet he found her planning to save him and to save those others from the results of her treachery what was she going to do not murder that would be a bush vengeance he couldn't consent to that but even if he wanted to prevent what could he do unless he came down and revealed himself and that would make an end of them both and so roland waited his ear close to the ventilator listening the sounds of their voices zoya's laugh the clink of glasses was this the weak link in the old man's armor wein weib and after a while he heard no sound of any kind what was happening the train was winding laboriously up through a narrow dark valley beside a mountain tarn from time to time a red glare shot from the furnace doors of the locomotive and then a shower of cinders fell upon him the air was chill and roland shivered with the cold a 
a glance at the east alarmed him for the first signs of the coming dawn had appeared it would not be long before daylight would come and with it discovery of his position by some switchman or station agent he crouched lower clinging to the ventilator and listened again a sound repeated at regular intervals and growing in volume a snore a man's snore von stromberg slept and then he heard zoya's voice close at his ear philippe it said he sleeps you must come down but wait a moment i will see he waited breathless and in a moment heard her at the window of the compartment then her voice again there is no stop for half an hour yet you must descend where is the guard he asked in the carriage in front descend by the rear and enter the window is open good with a glance around roland raised his head and slowly slid his body backwards until he found the iron ladder by which he had climbed and descended waiting a moment at the corner of the car to peer out along the guards and then bending down below the line of windows swung himself along the steps to the window where zoya was waiting him and in a moment had tumbled in head first upon the floor beside her in the dim light of the further corner von stromberg lay sprawled helpless his head back his mouth open snoring stentoriously he was not pretty to look at but he wasn't in the least formidable teeth were missing he was only senility asleep roland stared at him a moment in wonder what has happened he asked my medicine the opiate in his wine glass he never knew you didn't give him too much i hope not there was nothing else to do roland caught her by the hand zoya you're four square it's fifty-fifty now forgive me and you she questioned i'm sorry i'm a beast we'll beat him now but the guard he won't bother us his excellency gave orders that he was not to be disturbed the guard has not dared to look in since but we'll draw the curtain again they stood hand in hand and gazed at the prostrate giant to think that anything like that could frighten one said roland with a grin i think i could die happy if i tickled his nose and then how did you know i was there i didn't until i saw you i searched at munich it was a fearful risk for you to take i had to take it but i'll confess i didn't know what i was going to do when daylight came unless i tumbled off i'm not quite sure that i know now the train stops at weissenburg we must get off there by the opposite door and run for it are you up to it zoya you've had no sleep the excitement i'm no weakling mon brave the daylight filtered slowly through the curtain of the carriage and still von stromberg slept twice the train stopped and each time by way of precaution roland crouched in a corner hidden under the travelling rug of his excellency at the second station zoya pulled up the curtain and inquired of the guard the distance yet to be travelled herr graf von stromberg was asleep and desired on no account to be disturbed even when they reached their destination if he still slept the car was to remain in the station was this understood she spoke in tones of authority and the man bowed and said he would repeat the orders madame need have no fear that they would not be obeyed zoya's face was pallid and the cold light of the morning was merciless but she smiled at roland and sat calmly beside their sleeping enemy fully aware of the nature of the sacrifice she had made her fate was now bound up with roland's his with hers failure now meant the extreme penalty of this man's power for them both and his power was limitless but a change had come over her since the scene in the room in the schweigerstrasse she was very quiet very pale smiling when he spoke but making few comments and uttering no reproaches 
she was like a soul already judged already condemned and awaiting punishment roland took her hand and held it in his it was very cold and made no response to his pressure it seemed that all the good in her all the bad all the noble all the selfish all indeed that was zoya rochal had been fused in the heat of a great emotion then suddenly chilled with disillusion zoya he said softly i'm sorry she smiled a little as you have said it's fifty-fifty mon brave but i am no fool i am aware of the sacrifice i make for her she laughed aloud my sickness has made me weak my claws are sheathed mon philippe i shall not scratch her i have paid have i not yes zoya in full she gave a sigh and a little shrug that seemed meant to deny it it is strange i seem to look upon you now as one who has happened a long while since you belong to a dream of what might have been you are very young mon philippe also beautiful and brutal as a god oh i say zoya i talk across a distance philippe from a dream you threw me to the floor brutally i adored you it was curious never in my life before philippe i swear it not like this even with this girl waiting for you yonder i knew i had to i had to save you to repair the damage and pay my debt fifty-fifty as you say mon philippe you paid already i have an idea that i shall pay more no you do not know in the end the woman pays for all with interest the balance will yet be on my side of the ledger i'll square it zoya some way he muttered her fingers moved in his you may square it now mon philippe she whispered for all time kiss me no upon the brow a uh, benedictus voila i am forgiven nicht wahr cleansed the new fire burns up the old she rose abruptly and peered out through the slit in the curtain clean cold passionless like the new day she muttered it cannot be long now you shall succeed you too we will cross the lake somehow to freedom perhaps at least i have done what i could n'est-ce pas she raised the hand of von stromberg and let it drop upon the seat he will do but his snore is like the ride of the valkyries no one will dare disturb him have you ever been to lindau no he replied but it's on an island lindenhof is what we want a village a mile to the west do you think you can make it three miles from weissenberg yes i don't seem to be tired he looked at her anxiously her face was paler even than before in the cool light but its expression was quite calm and even smiling a sudden grinding of the brakes of the train as it drew into a station while the guards called out its name roland stumbling over the legs of the prostrate von stromberg rushed to the left-hand door lowered the window and peered out the train came to a stop luck zoya whispered roland a train of goods cars just opposite we've got to start at once and without further words he stepped on the seat and swung himself out of the window to the step below without a moment's hesitation zoya followed feet first and roland lowered her beside him and after closing the window of the compartment took her hand in his and together they bent forward beneath the goods car where they paused in a moment of danger while roland whispered i will go first our clothing we must not be seen together follow when i pause and with a slight pressure of the fingers he left her and crawled out upon the further side there was but one person in sight a gate woman her back turned roland walked a few steps then paused and zoya emerged and followed him he turned into a country road to the southward walking rapidly until he reached a clump of trees where he waited until zoya came up with him 
when he drew her into the security of the bushes where he bade her sit down a moment to rest while they planned which way to go in which direction was lindenhof and where schloss kempelstein End of chapter twenty four Chapter twenty five of the Golden Bow by George Gibbs. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tony Oliva. Kempelstein. Scher Zoya, said Roland in a moment, as he smoked a much desired cigarette. This will not do at all. We must never be seen together in these costumes. You look like the front cover of a fashion magazine, and I like a coal miner up for the air but we haven't any time to lose in ten minutes the sleeping beauty will roll into the bahnhof at lindau waiting for someone to wake him with a kiss they'll be getting suspicious in fifteen minutes and after that they'll go over this smiling land with a fine-tooth comb and if there are no teeth out of it they'll draw something there's one way what philip a bee-line for the lake how far is it not over a mile or so i think you can see the water shimmering through the trees let's go then you're not too tired no lead on i'll follow he peered out of their place of concealment and walked in a leisurely way along the road behind them at the railroad gate the old woman still sat knitting both trains had gone the way to the lake was clear a country road little travelled a fresh breeze had started up and the sun had broken above the low hanging bands of moisture and laid a pretty pattern of the shimmering foliage along his path the business of escaping seemed absurdly simple only a few miles of water between himself and freedom but the uncertainty about tanya and markoff made him grave had they received his message last night and if so had they heeded it and come on safely to lindenhof more ifs came suddenly into his mind than he cared to think about markoff was clever and with the hurdy-gurdy could have been counted on to reach schloss kempelstein without difficulty but without the hurdy-gurdy and surrounded by police and soldiers all of whom had been notified of his passage across bavaria how would he fare was he equal to such an emergency that was the risk in a moment roland had proof of the thoroughness with which von stromberg had done his work for at the next crossing two provincial policemen awaited his approach scrutinizing him carefully he nodded to them cheerfully and bade them good morning but they stood in his path and he stopped rather alarmed at the unexpected turn of events but he kept his easy pose admirably and his grin disarmed them your name please asked the older man with pleasure politely leo knaus you are of the railroad assuredly do i not look black enough quite so where do you live in kempton where do you go now roland laughed to the lake for a bath you would like to do the same if you had spent the night upon my locomotive here the younger man broke in the man described has gray hair as you will see that of herr knaus is black ay and his skin too laughed roland and then you were looking for some one a tall man with gray hair and a girl whose hair is reddish-brown you did not see by chance upon the road a hurdy-gurdy a piano organ on wheels drawn by a small donkey i am a fireman there is no time to examine the scenery but wait roland took off his cap and scratched his head a hurdy-gurdy you say with a donkey yes yes you've seen i think i'm sure yesterday near immenstadt a donkey a very small donkey yes a small donkey 
and a man and woman walking at dusk last night where the railroad and the highway ran parallel near the lake of immenstadt i am sure there is no grade there and i was resting leaning against the side of my coal-box my engineer duvenek that does not matter you are sure of what you tell positive you will report to the weissenburg station when you have had your bath assuredly my engine is there i go on duty this afternoon good at this moment zoya rochal came up to the group and staring blankly passed on reddish hair repeated the older man of course i could not see the color of the woman's hair we will see to this at once the telegraph nussbaum and off they went traveling back along the road by which roland had come with a grin he watched them depart on their wild goose chase immenstadt was east weingarten west and never the twain shall meet he quoted cheerfully to himself aware of the fact that not yet had the net been closed around markoff and tanya and he roland had perhaps widened its mouth by fifty miles or so but such expedients were dangerous and made the necessity for his disappearance and zoya's from the immediate neighborhood a matter of great urgency he went on toward the lake following zoya rochal compelling his feet to move slowly while every impulse urged speed already sleeping von stromberg must have been discovered and it would not be many minutes before the alarm would go out for zoya rochal her trim dark figure moved steadily in front of him a hundred yards away slowly reducing the distance to the water which roland could now see at the foot of the lane there were boats there he could see them clearly now boats of all kinds zoya seemed to move more slowly more painfully she was tired out he hurried forward and passed her courage he whispered we are not suspected can you go on she was very pale yes yes a little faint courage he repeated he strode on more rapidly now passing through a village of small frame houses of the poorer sort reaching the foot of the lane where there was a jetty beyond which several sailboats were anchored there was an old man on the jetty cleaning some fish which he had taken out of a sailboat alongside roland lighted a cigarette and approached him leisurely good luck he asked the man looked up with the taciturnity of fishermen fair he said any boats to hire the man looked roland over from top to toe his fish-knife suspended in the air you don't think i can pay because i am a workman i am off for a holiday my friend see and roland exhibited a hundred mark note with an air of great pride the fisherman became more interested at once but shook his head there is a new law about renting boats to strangers you must have a pass from the officer commanding at lindau roland laughed strangers <laughs> that's pretty good and me working between weissenburg and kempton for ten years the fisherman rose and took up his bucket of fish i'm sorry your money is as good as anyone else's but it can't be done roland looked around him quickly there was no one in sight upon the shore and only the slender figure of zoya rochal slowly approaching him along the jetty alongside the raft to which the man had descended to wash his fish was the sailboat he had used the breeze was fresh and from the south the boom swung noisily to and fro roland's mind was working rapidly zoya joined him courage he whispered go down she obeyed him descending the wooden steps to the lower level the fisherman looked up indifferently and rose his fish strung you're sure you don't want to change your mind asked roland pleasantly no it is verboten is this your boat yes but a hundred marks herr fisherman said roland bringing the money out and holding it before the man's eyes again the man dropped his fish and scowled at roland 
donnerwetter have i not said there was no time to waste roland had put both their necks into a noose which this idiot would draw if they parleyed longer get in the sailboat zoya he said coolly and the bewildered fisherman watched her obey your money my boat the man shouted rushing forward but he got no further for roland shoved him violently tripping him skilfully at the same time and he disappeared into the water zoya was already in the boat and before the fisherman came to the surface roland had cast off the bowline and pushed away from the raft the fellow rose sputtering and tried to clamber in but found himself looking into the barrel of roland's automatic Herr gut the fellow muttered and dropped back into the water by this time the sailboat had swung off from the dock roland hauled in the sheet pulled up the lug sail and a quick twist of the tiller sent her on her way silly fool said roland half to himself he's merely out a hundred marks the craft heeled over and the foam rushed out from under her counter bubbling aft in a manner most cheerful to see but before roland had worked clear of the other boats at anchor he heard a sound behind him and looking over his shoulder saw the drenched figure of his friend the fisherman rushing along the jetty shouting like a demon figures emerged along the shore and stood watching curiously and when the man reached them and told his story there was a good deal of running around and waving of arms but the thing that interested roland most was the fact that while he looked no one ran out on the jetty or toward the rowboats they may have disliked the taciturn fisherman as roland had done or they may have thought that he dreamed there may be a telephone in that dump grinned roland but i'll risk a hundred marks on it meanwhile he steered for the open lake sure that the rule against the use of petrol which applied to motor-cars would also apply to power-boats for the present at least they were safe and skimming along under a quartering breeze which showed no signs of diminishing zoya sat rigidly upon the hard bench her gaze on the town of lindau which separated from the mainland by a bridge seemed to be slowly rising from the water he is there she said with a shudder imagine when he wakes free the guard poor devil and then joyously zoya we've beaten them yes the gods are good do you feel better better yes but i am very tired will you lie down yonder and try to rest yes philippe she was very submissive he covered her with his coat and she thanked him softly but again he noticed the air of indifference of restraint of passive acceptance of the new relationship between them the breeze was life-giving and the craft which bore the name of elsa seemed as deeply imbued as roland with the exigencies of the occasion for as the breeze freshened she leaped joyously toward the distant shore as though aware of an important mission which had nothing to do with trout or felchen roland steered wide of all other craft fishermen's boats returning to lindau a steamer just leaving the hafen for rorschach and having covered as he thought a sufficient distance from his point of departure swung in again toward the bavarian shore markoff had described schloss kempelstein to him a solitary tower upon the shore of the lake west of lindau there was a small jetty too with boats such a place should not be difficult to find he searched the shore with his gaze and found a tower much nearer lindau than he had supposed at the sudden change in the motion of the elza coming around on the other tack zoya rochal started up and looked at the rapidly approaching shore it seems a pity she said quietly he understood her but answered cheerfully enough we'll come through zoya don't worry it's death this time philippe well he laughed we'll go merrily there's only one thing i regret what philippe that i didn't tickle his excellency under the chin 
i hope he doesn't tickle us under ours mon vieux she said rather grimly the tower of schloss kempelstein grew in height and now the ruined walls surrounding it appeared there was a sailboat moored alongside the jetty and one or two small boats drawn up on the shore by the tower roland watched the place eagerly and the elsa rushed on her bows dipping heavily into the cross seas drenching them both with foam zoya leaned forward her hands clasped over the gunwale pale calm indifferent to her discomfort her wide weary gaze fixed like roland's on the jetty beside the tower there was an arch which connected the tower with a ruined building alongside and it was in the shadow of this arch that they were both suddenly aware of figures moving two men and two women the elza was still too far away for them to distinguish faces but the figures stood for a moment as though in conversation and then seemed to move toward the jetty behind the ruin upon what seemed to be a high road there were men on horseback riding in a cloud of dust there's something going on zoya whispered roland tensely what does this mean the elza was now rushing in headlong roland was so eager to shorten the distance that he had taken no account of the possible dangers of the beach or the necessities of a safe landing but he put the helm up now and let the craft swing down the beach a hundred yards or so while he watched the figures on the pier now plainly distinguishable one of the women was tanya korasov the other woman roland stared in astonishment it was no woman but a monk in a belted robe and while roland and zoya looked they saw the monk direct tanya to the sailboat alongside the jetty there was a shout from the men in the shadow of the arch as they rushed out toward the figure of the monk as they emerged into the sunlight the monk raised an arm gesturing and then there was a loud report and one of the men under the arch seemed to stumble and fall then they saw him half rise and crawl on toward the monk another report and the crawling man sank to the ground and moved no more the other man hesitated and then ran back to the shadow of the arch good old markov shouted roland the monk is markov zoya and then again wildly the boat he shouted to the monk they're coming markov behind you from the road zoya had started up at the beginning as the shots were fired and had leaned forward her eyes peering in horror that's not markov she whispered now to roland not markov she repeated it was he yonder she sank down upon the seat and buried her head in her hands not markov he muttered then who an inkling of the truth came into roland's mind at the same moment for the man in the monk's robes turned and catching up a bag that lay beside him upon the jetty caught tanya by the arm helped her abruptly into the boat and pushed off from the jetty just as the cavalcade of horsemen rode through the arch roland saw them dismount and rush forward upon the jetty but the boat had swung off and her sail had caught the breeze so that by the time the men in uniform had reached the end of the jetty there was thirty feet of clear water quickly widening between them the soldier shouted and one of them drew a revolver but the man in the monk's robes had leveled his weapon again and fired roland was now near enough to see quite clearly the features of the monk even without a mustache roland recognized the man who had done the shooting gregory hochwald the elza was now working up close hauled under the lee of the other sailboat which was making for the open waters of the lake the soldier kneeled and hochwald pushed tanya down below the gunwale the automatic of the soldier spoke again and again but without effect for roland saw hochwald rise in his place and make a derisive gesture the other soldiers fired also but the bullets spattered harmlessly in the water herr hochwald had been so busily engaged in making his escape that he had not been aware of the elza 
which had come up under his lee not a hundred meters away but as he set his course for the open water he glanced over his shoulder at the elza where roland crouched at the tiller was slowly overhauling him roland saw him laugh and say something to tanya who straightened her white face gazing across the space of water at roland but without recognition zoya lay face downwards upon the seat silent and motionless roland crouched lower his cap pulled over his eyes the meaning of the events upon the wharf had come to him slowly and not until he had seen hochwald's face did he realize what this escape meant to him and to tanya but having grasped the facts he planned quickly for the present at least their common foe was baffled and every mile that grew between the boats and the bavarian shore was so much to the credit of them both in a defensive alliance which should not in the least cloud the personal issue between roland and hochwald there was going to be a reckoning of some sort presently when they reached the centre of the lake a reckoning which would balance all grievances roland had suddenly become quite calmly exhilarated and zoya raised her head and looked at him in pallid astonishment as her look questioned he answered it's hochwald zoya the priest is hochwald and as she straightened to look keep down below the gunwale he doesn't know we're going to surprise him what are you going to do oh just trail along he was silent again thinking and she questioned no more indeed from the look of her she was more dead than alive and roland found time to wonder how she had managed to keep up for so long he marvelled at the look of sudden terror that had come into her face when matthias markoff had fallen it had been as though suddenly in that dreadful moment she had had a vision of the ghosts of her sins against him poor markoff but the memory of tanya's frightened face in herr hochwald's boat soon blotted all else from roland's mind tanya there with his arch enemy hochwald escaping to freedom and switzerland with tanya and the treasure of nemi what chance could have thrown them together for nothing but chance could have aided hochwald where such a man as von stromberg had failed chance chance should not avail him now the elza was nemesis and she seemed to be aware of it for she outfooted the heavy craft of hochwald three to two but roland was not ready to come up with hochwald yet not until they had passed the middle of the lake and were safely over the swiss line so he eased the elza up into the wind and let her hang there from time to time until a mile or two had been covered when he hauled his lug sail as close as he could and crossing the stern of hochwald's boat stole up the windward where he kept the elza sail between hochwald and himself roland could now see that hochwald was puzzled by the actions of this other boat which clung to him so closely and tried to come closer up into the wind but roland edged away all the while forging ahead and choosing a position which would give him the advantage when they came to terms the wind was now blowing half a gale from the mountains to the southward and the heavy clouds which had formed above their peaks came rolling down deeper and deeper in shadow as a presage of more wind to come but the elza was a good sea-boat and had so far shipped little but the crests of foam zoya sat upon the seat leaning on one elbow her eyes dully watching the race from time to time she turned and glanced at roland who smiled at her encouragingly but said nothing the german shore was now hardly distinguishable through the mists of flying spume and shadow there was a steamer in the direction of lindau roland had marked her for the last ten minutes and she was coming fast travelling under forced draught for from time to time her stack belched clouds of black smoke and now there was a deep boom which rolled with sullen reverberations across the water and at the same moment almost a column of spray shot up in the air two hundred yards to the elza's left zoya started upright and glanced at roland 
who knew what this new danger meant the patrol boat soya he said coolly somebody's given our show away will they catch us i hope not a stern chase and we're legging it pretty fast it's von stromberg she said with the abstracted air of the fatalist one cannot get the best of the game with von stromberg we shall cried roland triumphantly look soya the swiss patrol she followed the direction of his arm and saw stealing out from the huffen of a roman's horn over their starboard bow another steamer of about the same size as their pursuer there was no time to spare if roland's argument with herr hochwald was to be concluded before the interesting conflict of these new forces another distant boom and another geyser of water shot into the air a hundred feet nearer can you sail a boat zoya he asked of her no but i'm willing to try she said with a strange smile roland brought the elza up into the wind and held her there until the boat of herr hochwald drew up on even terms then he eased up the helm and steered a course that would bring the two boats together in a few moments he saw hochwald who had by this time thrown off his monk's robe rise in the stern of the other boat and scrutinize him eagerly his sail meanwhile flapping uncertainly but the elza bore down on him like an avenging angel until only a few yards of water separated the two boats by this time hochwald who had guessed that the actions of the elza boded him no good had put his helm up to run for it but roland his cap pulled well down over his eyes maneuvered skillfully and brought the elza alongside and there they rushed for a second or so crashing together the foam dashing over them the white water flashing between quick zoya cried roland hold her as she is and leaving the helm he dashed forward seizing the elza's bowline leaped into the air safely and took a quick turn of the painter around the mast of hochwald's boat hochwald had recognized him now and began firing as roland saw tanya rise from the bottom of the boat where she had been lying keep down tanya he cried triumphantly in the voice that she knew so well it's i philippe illustration keep down tanya he cried it's i philippe she obeyed him in a fascination of surprise and terror saw zoya rochal clamber from one boat to the other and rise heard the reports of firearms saw zoya's eyes widen saw her clutch at her breast and stumbling fall just behind philippe who had run aft toward hochwald firing as he went tanya hid her face in her hands for a second then rose watching the two men swaying in a deadly embrace there was another shot from hochwald's weapon muffled against the body of philippe but he still struck and struggled lifting hochwald clear of the gunwale as tanya ran aft roland fell half over the side while hochwald hung a moment his face ghastly feebly gripping for a hold and then disappeared in the green swirl of water astern tanya caught at roland's shoulder and hauled him back into the boat and he sank into her arms the smile still on his lips a smile that now twitched painfully for upon his soaking shirt above the breast was a dark spot spreading rapidly tanya he was muttering cast off other boat steer swiss patrol and then his head fell forward and he was silent she gazed at him in anguish but laid him gently down and ran quickly forward the boats were thrashing together dangerously and the other was half full of water with difficulty she cast off the line zoya lay upon it but at last she got it free and ran back to philippe who was lying where she had laid him the water in the cockpit washing over him she sat beside the tiller raising his head in her lap trying with her handkerchief to staunch the flow of blood from his wound was it to be death after all steer swiss patrol she caught at the sheet beside her that hochwald had pulled and fastened to the cleat a huge wave came over the bow and frightened her 
but she grasped the tiller and headed toward the swiss shore the swiss patrol boat loomed larger larger but the other the german boat still came on a white cataract at its bows she did not seem to care now the rush of the waves of the growing storm roared in her ears as though from a great distance before her out of the gray of the mist and rain came the loom of the shore she heard the hails of men they seemed to be all about her but she knew not how to obey and only sat clinging to the tiller and to roland whose head was against her body very pale and still she was aware of a boat alongside of her man by men in smart uniforms one of whom leaped over into her boat gave one quick glance around and then at first gently and then with more force released the tiller from her hand if the fräulein will permit a voice said you are lieutenant hofmeyer of the swiss lake patrol she raised her head blankly staring at him and then as he caught her in his arms suddenly relaxed End of chapter 25chapter twenty six of the golden bow by george gibbs this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by tony oliva finis the navy of land-locked switzerland has always been a subject for jest among nations that go down to the sea in ships but the patrol service of lake constance which guards the line running midway down the length of the lake against illegality the smuggling of arms and ammunition the use of improper passports and all the illicit dealings that are a part of the secret operations of nations at war has been and continues to be a highly efficient force in the preservation of neutral relations herr lieutenant hofmeyer no lover in spite of his name of methods teutonic took as great a pride in his craft as though she had been a twenty thousand ton battleship as much joy in his two small deck rifles as though they had been thirty-eight centimeters in caliber it was his business to watch the lake for signs of suspicious craft and especially to note the movement of the german government vessels at lindau and friedrichshafen so that when the german patrol emerged from lindau vomiting black smoke he came out at once assured that the two small fishing boats that he had been watching for some moments crossing in the storm were the objects of german attention the round shots sent as warning aroused him to greater interest especially as now it was clear that the sailboats had reached swiss waters over which herr lieutenant hofmeyer had dominion he was somewhat jealous of his authority and found himself growing warm as the firing proceeded quite in contravention of international agreements and so just to show that he was on the job and not lightly to be considered he had his bow gun cast loose and fired one shot well to windward of the pursuing boat the sailboats were now easily visible to the herr lieutenant with the naked eye and he noted with amazement the crashing of the two boats together the reports of firearms and the fight that followed in which one man had gone overboard and so when he got within hailing distance he shouted to the occupants of one sailboat which had now swung clear but got no answer so he gave several quick orders and when his vessel lost way jumped into his gig which was swung overside and pulled rapidly to the badly sailing lugger there was a girl at the helm a very beautiful girl with reddish-brown hair who looked at him blankly and refused to relinquish the helm she was bewildered and terrified and after a brief question fainted in his arms in the bottom of the boat at her feet a man lay bleeding from a wound in his body and forward in the wash of the water the boat had shipped 
another woman dead the herr lieutenant took the helm and brought the lugger alongside the gangway of his craft where with the help of his gig crew the unconscious girl the wounded man and the dead woman were carried upon deck his boatswain also bringing up from the lugger a black robe and a large valise which weighed heavily lieutenant hofmeyer gave some brief orders a restorative for the girl first aid for the wounded man who though desperately hurt had a chance for life then mounted his bridge and took down his megaphone for the german patrol boat had drawn up within a cable's length and was now lowering a boat to come aboard him i would inform you herr lieutenant that you have already violated neutrality by firing over my line he roared he spoke of the international boundary with a casual air of possession that was habitual with him escaping spies came the reply we are within our rights you have no rights in swiss territory he snapped and lowered the megaphone for his boatswain had mounted the bridge beside him and saluted the lady has come too sir and would like to speak to you at once very good take the deck and receive the herr lieutenant i will return and with a glance at the approaching boat he went below tanya was sitting up among some pillows on a bench in the cabin she was very pale her skin transparent like onyx blue-veined her gray eyes dark and luminous you wanted to see me asked the lieutenant with brisk politeness yes herr hofmeyer herr hofmeyer i plead with you that you do not give us up i am a russian the wounded man an american we claim the protection of swiss neutrality the german captain claims that you are spies it is not true i was taken into germany against my will by the man who was drowned an agent of the german government with the money in the valise yonder which we have recovered and breathlessly in as few words as possible she told him her story he listened attentively aware of the fact that his captive was struggling bravely against her weakness against terror of the horrors through which she had passed in the midst of their conversation a sailor entered touching his cap herr lieutenant zapp of the bodensee patrol and his excellency general graf von stromberg tanya stared past the man toward the door of the cabin as though expecting to see the terrible old man following the messenger herr hofmeyer she pleaded his power is without limit it is death for me hofmeyer turned and dismissed the man i will be on deck in a moment and then to tanya gently you are no spy no i swear it nor he the american nor he that also i swear he caught the hands she extended toward him and pressed them firmly that's all i want to know fear nothing even the german emperor has no dominion over me you will not let them no be at rest and with a smile he vanished through the door and went up on deck walking straight to where the two visitors awaited him then halting saluted after formal introductions general von stromberg smiled it was most kind of you herr lieutenant hofmeyer we are thankful for your assistance we have come to relieve you of our prisoners bitte said hofmeyer our prisoners repeated von stromberg we have come for them there is doubtless some misunderstanding said the swiss officer politely i have no prisoners of yours as herr lieutenant sapp will doubtless tell you come herr lieutenant broke in von stromberg we do not wish to delay you or indeed to be delayed our time is short and mine i have a patient who must go to the hospital at once and you have the temerity to say that you will not relinquish these prisoners to me hofmeyer bowed you have not mistaken my meaning and you are willing to accept the consequences of this action beyond doubt or i would not take it von stromberg turned to his companion herr lieutenant sapp 
it cannot be that this gentleman is aware of my power my authority you are mistaken broke in the swiss quite coolly you are herr general graf von stromberg head of the military sections of the imperial german secret service geheimrat privy councillor of his majesty emperor william the second he took two steps toward the brass rail and pointed but your power your authority ends yonder a mile away if you are unfamiliar with the treaties with the law which governs the bodensee herr lieutenant sapp will doubtless enlighten you on your way back to lindau you are impudent sir i am merely obedient to those who command me those who command you shall command your dismissal this is not prussia excellency not while i do my duty von stromberg glared at the boy as though he would have liked to strangle him do you realize that the money which these prisoners have looted belongs to citizens of germany that is a matter which the courts will determine said the swiss lightly von stromberg shrugged and laughed unpleasantly <laughs> you are a very foolish young man then after a moment of hesitation he took a pace forward catching hofmeyer by the arm and walking a few paces along the deck with him whispering in the midst of the conversation the swiss suddenly flung away bribery he cried hotly you found the wrong man excellency i will give you one minute to leave my ship or i will take you to switzerland and intern you and walking to the gangway he pointed down to where the visiting boat lay the men at their oars your boat awaits you herr lieutenant sapp i bid you good morning excellency von stromberg scowled bit his lip and scowled again but he followed his lieutenant down the ladder and silently entered the boat wrapping himself in his great cape and was rowed away lieutenant hofmeyer mounted to the bridge and gave the orders for full speed ahead and then he leaned over the rail and watched the small craft approach the german patrol boat sacred pig of a prussian bully on my own quarter-deck too tish and he spat to leeward for three weeks roland had lain in the hospital at rorschach unaware of the storm that had raged about his bed for a week he had been between life and death for the bullet of herr hochwald had passed through his right lung and embedded itself between the ribs at his side but careful nursing and the ministrations of an excellent surgeon had pulled him through and the danger point had long since passed modern firearms unless they kill outright are not necessarily fatal and modern surgery almost an exact science is on the side of strong constitutions and so roland the bullet removed was now convalescent sitting in a wonderful armchair by a sunny window looking out across the lake that had come so near being his grave toward the bavarian shore where in the distance he could just see the dim outlines of the island of lindau rising from the water tanya had been to see him twice chased off once each for a few moments only in the presence of his nurse and yesterday tanya had told him that all was going well that influence had been brought to bear at berne by Shestov, bartou and the swiss councillors of nemi and that the money of the society which he had fought so hard to bring back was in the way of being restored to its rightful trustees tanya was coming to visit him again this morning and he had been promised a half hour with her alone thus it was that the sun of the morning seemed so bright and the cloud-flecked sky so blue also he had shaved and was conscious of a supreme sense of well-being she came to him all in white as became a bride looking extraordinarily handsome radiant with happiness and glowing with the joy of his recovery the nurse who was a discreet person smiled at them both and withdrew he held out his arms and without a word she came in to them kneeling 
philippe she murmured you are sure that you are getting well it seems right as rain the cough has stopped in a week i'll be as strong as ever and then he paused and she raised her lips to his flushing adorably and then she knew what he wanted to say but she wanted him to say it you and i tanya my wife whenever you wish philippe roland she murmured to-day he urged whenever you wish we have one life together he was silent in a moment of soberness we have a great work to do tanya yes we shall do it together russia her voice sank oh mon philippe my country the cause seems so hopeless anarchy nothing less order will follow reason regeneration honor cannot come from dishonor russia is false a judas among the nations roland laughed cheer up my princess wave your wand and all will yet be well my wand a reed philippe broken i have never felt so weak so powerless but never have you been so strong for in you i have already found new strength new power authority but there must be no more medievalism in nemi tanya i have been thinking much i have learned something in germany we must make a new fight for the people yonder they are not ready yet but soon soon in the meanwhile we can work secretly our giant with a hundred arms has only been groping in the darkness but he has a giant's strength he shall use it if you and i alone against von stromberg all germany can emerge victorious we can win again and again we have given the first blow and are unharmed there are rumors of strikes you have heard there will be other strikes more bloodshed until the people of germany arise in their might a dream perhaps but it is a good dream for france for england and america but of one thing i am resolved that the society of nemi shall not pass into the hands of the enemies of our allies god forbid hochwald others will come like him from russia from germany but they shall not win for we will know them but if you are interned they know nothing of my service in the french army i shall not tell them Bartu hopes for my full freedom i was almost hoping she paused and pressed his hand gently what that they would intern you i am afraid of danger now philippe i never was before the legend there shall be no more legends he laughed kissing her hands gently and yet after all was it not a legend that brought me princess tatiana but she is here to guard you against danger philippe roland death seems to me so much the more terrible now that life and happiness stretch before us both Puzoya and markoff but they went together as he would have wished she hid her face in her hands together yes i can never forget him never nor i she loved you philippe she whispered he was silent thinking and then she did what she could to atone one is judged i think by one's whole life tanya not a part of it her record is finished but its last item is the most important she paid in blood he finished soberly and grisha kodkina he too roland shrugged he was game he muttered she took from her handbag some papers much wrinkled soiled and water-stained his dossier will hardly need it now he caught her hands in his and the papers fell to the floor papers once so significant and now merely soiled papers we have now this moment tanya let us forget everything else 
later we will give for others now we will take for ourselves it is too wonderful to be true like the fairy tale listen and i will tell it to you once upon a time there was a very small boy who lived in a very large house in a very noisy city and there came to him in his dreams a wonderful fairy who carried a wand with a star at its end which had the property of making all good things come true her name was princess tatiana and he loved her for she was very very beautiful tanya laid her fingers across his lips is not our own fairy story more beautiful than this he kissed her fingers and then since her lips were near took them too for fairy tales beautiful as they may be are after all mere creatures of dreams and tanya's lips were very real the end end of chapter twenty six end of the golden bow by george gibbs